Wetlands Live, a distance learning adventure. My name is Rebecca Havens and I'll be your host for today's program. I work for the USDA Forest Service, which manages approximately 193 million acres of national forests and grasslands throughout the U.S. That's about the size of Texas. Thousands of students are watching this program today and we welcome you all. Wetlands Live is encouraging students and adults to learn about wetlands and get outside to enjoy and become involved in these important and interesting places. You'll find lots more information on the website at the web address on the screen. Today's the last Wetlands Live broadcast, but be sure to check out the FS Nature Live website and Facebook page to find out about upcoming webcasts from the Forest Service and the Prince William Network. Today we're going to be discovering wetlands here around Cordova, Alaska and in several other special places. Cordova is located in South Central Alaska in the Prince William Sound and right next to the Copper River Delta, the largest continuous wetland on the Pacific coast of North America. The Copper River Delta is known for its abundance of fish and wildlife, including migratory species such as shorebirds and salmon. Every spring, approximately 5 million shorebirds use this area as a stopover site to rest and refuel on their journey north to their breeding grounds in the Arctic. This area is also known for its abundant population of salmon. The wetlands here are nurseries for juvenile salmon and provide them with plentiful food resources and protection from predators. We followed the migration of shorebirds from the Bay of Panama up here to Alaska where they are passing through on their way to the Arctic. These shorebirds may have also spent time in other coastal areas such as San Francisco Bay and Boundary Bay where our October program took place. In that program we waded into wetlands and learned about what makes a wetland and why they are important. In Panama we learned about wetland connections and how migratory populations rely on a healthy string of wetlands to survive. Today we're going to see how students around the country have been getting out and discovering wetlands. We'll meet the fifth graders from Mount Eccles Elementary School in Cordova who have been exploring wetlands to learn more about shorebirds, salmon, and wetlands restoration. They'll be talking about what they've learned so far and show us what they're doing in wetlands around Cordova. Before we begin, we've got a special message from Lisa Murkowski, a senator from Alaska. Hi, this is Lisa Murkowski. For those of you who don't know me, I am one of the United States Senators from the state of Alaska, and I join you today from the halls of the United States Capitol Building. I'd like to welcome you all to the third webcast of Wetlands Live, filmed in my great state, Alaska. In this program, you'll see how kids across the United States are discovering wetlands firsthand. Now, wetlands are vital for functioning and healthy ecosystems and for maintaining healthy habitats for abundant fish and wildlife populations not only in Alaska, but around the world. In addition to the benefits that wetlands provide people, other species, like our shorebirds, rely on the various wetlands during their migration across the globe and need these wetland connections to survive. I would encourage each and every one of you, get outside, explore your local wetlands in your community, in your state, and across the nation. I think you'll be surprised at the treasures that you will find. Enjoy the show, and don't forget to write in your wetlands questions for our experts to answer during the live web chat following the program. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Murkowski, for emphasizing how important wetlands are here in Alaska and everywhere. Now let's get on with the program. Today I'd like to introduce one of the fifth grade students from Mount Eccles Elementary School. This is Hennessy Hernandez. Hi, Hennessy. Hi, Rebecca. So we're going to start out by talking about some of the programs that you'll be involved with today. Can you tell me about the first program? Well, we're going to explore why shorebirds need many types of wetlands. We're going to look at the difference in the food webs between the mudflats and the uplands. Fantastic. I'm excited to learn about that. And then what's the second thing we're going to be doing today? Well, we'll be learning about what makes good salmon habitat and we're going to release a few of the salmon that we've been raising in a local stream. Awesome! And the third thing we're going to be doing today. We're going to use native plants to help restore local wetland. We'll be building garden beds, transplanting sheds, and talking about invasive plants. Very interesting. Thanks so much. I can't wait to learn about all of it. Over the course of this past school year, 
Schools across the state of Alaska and throughout the country have been getting out into wetlands and creating videos to document their experiences. Our partner organization, Alaska Geographic, hosted a video competition for Alaskan schools and two winners were selected, one for crowd favorite, one for expert's choice. All of the winning videos have been kept secret until today. To get started, I'd like to announce the winner of the expert's choice category, Ms. Spencer's class from Yakutat, Alaska. Let's take a look at their video now. Yakutat is located on the southeast of Alaska and is nestled between the Wrangell St. Elias mountain range to the east and the Gulf of Alaska to the west. Yakutat's economy depends on the wildlife and nature of the area. That is why protecting our wetlands is so important. The students of Miss Spencer's sixth grade class, the Forest Service, and the city and borough of Yakutat came together to promote the conservation of our wetlands in the face of climate change. The students wished to get first-hand experience in the research taking hand in the community. We went to a local muskrat bog. Even though it was completely covered in snow, we gained knowledge about its functions and information on the research at the Copper River Delta. Alaska boasts five different types of wetlands, or as the Clinkets call it, ka de e Since 1950, the overall surface temperature in Alaska has increased between 3.4 degrees and 5.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So Alaska is experiencing a greater temperature change than in areas closer to the equator. We are beginning to see the effect on climate change in wetland areas such as the Kenai Peninsula and the Arctic, where a larger species of trees are taking root in areas that were historically never able to grow before. So we know that climate change may have negative effects on our Yakutat wetlands, which is why we wanted to get involved in research. Wow, thanks Yakutat for that great video on wetlands. Today, I have Aaron Cooper, a wildlife biologist with the USDA Forest Service and the Chugach National Forest, and students from the fifth grade class at Mount Eccles Elementary. Hi Aaron. Hey there. Today we're gonna to be learning about wetlands. So Aaron, what are you and the students gonna be doing? Well, Hartney Bay is a great area for shorebird habitat, and we're going to explore the incredible shorebird habitat here at Hartney Bay. So we have three groups. We're going to look at the mud right next to the shoreline and see what's there. We're going to dig some holes and look and see what kind of invertebrates are there. And then we're going to look on top of the mud. And the shorebirds use, different shorebirds use different type of habitats based on their bills. And we're going to find out why the Copper River Delta is such an amazing place for shorebirds. Now, a lot of birds pass through the Copper River Delta, correct? That is right. We have about 5 million shorebirds that come through here every year on their way to the Arctic to nest and um, raise their young. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Hey, so are you guys ready to go learn about shorebirds? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go. We found some amazing things out here on the mud flats, and the, and this was we just all got we got all these things here today. So the first thing is what's in this jar, Jimmy? What's sand in this flies. jar? So where'd you find those? I was on the sand. On the top. The mud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kind of shorebird might eat those those flies? Um, would they would they have a long bill? Would they have a short, short bill? bill? They'd have a short bill, right? Because they're right on the top of the mud. Excellent. All right, so let's look in some of these buckets here. So what have you found? Let's look at over here. Can you guys tell me what you found in this bucket here? Amphipods. Amphipods? Yeah. 
And what else is in here? They made kind of a little great little habitat in here. Lots of shells, lots of seaweed. Um, anybody else want to say what they found in here? Um, snails. Snails? Clams. Clams? Amphipod babies hanging out to their moms. Oh, right. We found an amphipod that had babies hanging between their legs, right? You guys found some great stuff in here. Well, we have this bucket here, and you guys dug in the mud a little bit. Yep. And look at this bucket. It's full of what's in here? Clams. 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 And so these clams were, you were showing me earlier, they're from different depths, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, some are deeper. How deep are the deepest? How, was the, how deep was the deepest clam? It's about this deep. Yeah, okay. And so why don't you pick up one of the deeper clams out of this bucket and show me. Oh, okay. So there, that was a clam that was down a little deeper, right? And what about these other little, do you know what the name of these other, what, show me one of these other little pink ones. Oh, and, and who eats those? Shorebirds. Shorebirds. And how deep were those in the mud? <laughs> just, just under the surface so they could get their bills in there. Yeah. So how, do, how long would a shorebird bill have to be to get those? Short. They, they didn't have to, they don't have to be that long, right? Hey, Rebecca. How's it going? We, Hi, everyone. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for pointing out, talking about all the different shorebirds and uh -huh. showing all the different things that live in wetlands. And so now we're going to walk up to the uplands and check out everything that's there. You guys ready to go over there? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go. Well, you guys, we've learned a lot about shorebird habitat today, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've learned about the mud flats and how there's lots of food out there. But there's also a lot of food in the uplands and different types of shorebirds, right? Different types of shorebirds use different types of habitat. And that's really important because there are five million shorebirds that come through here every year. And you know what they do? They double their weight while they're here. And they double it by eating all these invertebrates and all the food that's out here on the mudflats and in the uplands. And that's really important because then they go up to the Arctic and they nest and they lay their eggs and then they raise their chicks and they need all that fat to survive and start the next cycle of life and all those birds and they go down south again to Panama. So this is a really important area for shorebirds. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thanks a lot, Erin, for everything that you've taught us about habitat, uplands, wetlands, and shorebirds. You may remember Miranda Anderson from our October webcast from Boundary Bay, Canada. Miranda is a filmmaker and environmental activist and was one of our Wetlands Live student hosts. She recently completed a film entitled The Child in Nature, a documentary about nature deficit disorder and the importance of children and youth getting out and experiencing nature. Let's check out a clip from the video. You can find a link to the full length version on the Wetlands Live website. It doesn't have to be complicated. A stream, a bog, a trail, a tree, a camping trip. Lots of things can teach you to appreciate nature and get outdoors. Try a few things and find out what interests you. Do something with your family, your friends, your neighbors, or maybe even just yourself. And you could find a passion you didn't even know you had. Thank you, Miranda. Nature and wetlands have been inspiring kids in schools and youth groups participating in Wetlands Live across the country over the course of this past school year. Now let's find out who our next video competition winner is. The crowd favorite winner for the Alaska Geographic video competition received the most votes from the public on the Wetlands Live Facebook page. The winning video for crowd favorite is ta ta ta, Ms. Hickox class from Girdwood, Alaska. Upon doing water quality testing in their watershed, the students discovered a serious problem. Let's check out their video to see what happened. Welcome to the Alaska News Update. My name is Isabel and today I'll be working with Nolan to bring you up to date on what's happening around the state. Thanks Isabel. And on to our top story, students from Mrs. Hickox's 3rd, 4th, and 5th grade class in Girdwood have been doing some skiing at Glacier Creek while monitoring water quality. We have our reporters Ava, Clara, and Annika down to get a first-hand look at what they are doing. Thanks, Nolan. From the banks of Glacier Creek and Girdwood, students have been working down here at the creek taking water samples for analysis. I've asked some students to come and talk with us to explain why. We're trying to figure out if Glacier Creek is healthy or not. 
All the valley is one big water chain and all creeks eventually flow right here into Glacier Creek. The snowmelt that comes from the mountain is the water we drink and it's also the water that all plants and animals need to survive. Let's go talk to those students to see what kind of tests they're doing. So what kind of tests are you doing to see if it's healthy or not? First we measured the temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, and fecal coliform. All of these measurements help tell us if the creek is healthy and if organisms can live in the creek. What other tests are you doing? After that, we take samples of macroinvertebrates. Macroinvertebrates are little aquatic bugs that live on the bottom of the creeks, and some of them are very sensitive to pollution. If you find a lot of them in Glacier Creek, then that is a good sign. Very interesting. Sounds like you students have a lot of work to do out here. Well, we do. Unfortunately, we are working with a representative from the Anchorage Waterways Council, a group in Anchorage that works to monitor and protect the local waterways. Matt, what part do you play in all of this? The Anchorage Waterway Council monitors creeks all around the city, and part of my job is to help teachers educate students to help take care of their watershed. This valley is un is our own watershed. It is unique because the Chugach National Forest, which is the second largest national forest in the whole country. Obviously, there are a lot of reasons for these students to be checking on Glacier Creek. Back to you, Isabella Nolan. Interesting things happening down there in Girdwood. And now we have Clara with some test results. Thanks, Isabel. The students have some disturbing findings to report. I have Fayla and Dessa here to report the most recent results. Well, we just got our results back from the fecal coliform test, and they were positive. Positive is good, right? No, positive means that there is fecal coliform bacteria in Glacier Creek. That's not good at all. What does that mean? What are you going to do? Well, the first thing we need to do is to do the test again to make sure we didn't make any mistakes. After we get the results from the second test, we'll have to think about what to do next. Well, thanks for sharing those results with us. Let's go to Anna co-standing by with a scientist who can help us understand all this. Thanks, Clara. I'm here with Dr. Brown. What can you tell us about fecal coliform? Fecal coliform is a bacteria that is, lives in the guts of animals. If it lives in their guts, then how does it get out into the environment? All things that live in your gut eventually come out of your body as waste. In other words, it comes out in poop. Okay, so we're talking about poop here? Yes, we're talking about poop. And poop in the water is bad, right? Yes, poop in the water is very bad. What does this mean for Glacier Creek and all the animals that live here? As you know, all waterways are connected and everything that in an ecosystem depends on everything else. If one part of the food chain is affected, then everything else in the food chain is affected too. The Glacier Creek watershed depends on clean water for the, mac for the people, the macroinvertebrates, fish, bears, moose, eagles, just to name a few. Even things that don't live in the watershed can be affected. Girdwood has wetlands that provide feeding grounds for migratory birds, or birds that are just passing through. If the bugs that feed these birds are not healthy, then the birds will not be healthy. It's really all connected. Thanks, Dr. Brown. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us about poop. I mean, fecal coliform. Weeks ago, we reported about a polluted creek in Girdwood. Welcome to our studio, Talon and Myla. Well, it's been several weeks since you found fecal coliform in your local creek. Have you found the source yet? We talked about what could be causing the problem, and one thing we know for sure is that Girdwood has lots of dogs, and not all dog owners are picking up their dog's poop. Since this might be part of the problem, our class has decided to make a commercial about cleaning up after your dog. We hope that people in Girdwood will watch and see how easy it is to scoop the poop and to keep our watershed clean and healthy. Let's take a look at that right now. Hey, what is that thing? You haven't heard? Parks and Rec has these poop bag stations all over Girdwood. Thanks for restocking the poop bag station. It's really handy when you forget your own bag. Do you always scoop your dog's poop? Of course. I wouldn't want bacteria getting in our waterways. Besides, scooping the poop is easy. Just scoop, flip, and tie. Remember to scoop the poop to keep our watershed healthy and clean. Nice job, students. I think you got your message across loud and clear. I hope your community gets a handle on the poop problem. Girdwood is a beautiful and unique spot in Alaska, and I think we all want it to stay that way. That's our broadcast for tonight. We'll see you here again tomorrow. 
Now, let's get back with our group here in Cordova that is studying salmon. I'd like to introduce Ken Hodges, a fisheries biologist on the Cordova Ranger District of the Chugach National Forest. Hi, Ken. Thank you for having us here. Um, we're here at uh, the creek at Fleming Spit, and uh, the students here are going to talk about uh, the salmon life cycle and uh, why the wetlands are important around here. So uh, this first picture here, uh, that looks like the, the eggs in the gravel, is that right? They're laid in the gravel so, so they are hidden from predators. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else happens down there while these, uh, these eggs are in the gravel? They get fertilized. Uh-huh, they're fertilized. And um, what happens next? They turn into elvens. Elvens, huh? Yep. And uh, what's an elven? <laughs> It, they're like fry, but they are underneath the gravel and they have an egg, sa yolk sa egg sac so they don't have to hunt. What do you call the, uh, the fish after they come up out of the gravel? Fry. Yeah, it looks like coho salmon. What, what's, uh, how can you tell a coho salmon? Because of their marks here mm -hmm. on their sides. Once they, they come out of here, then um, what do these uh, fish need? Food. Yeah. Food. Food. Uh -huh. Insects. Uh huh. Insect larvae. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Uh, what else do they need besides food? Dissolved oxygen and shelter. Uh, yep. Shelter. Yeah, that's right. What do you have for your next picture here? Smolt. Smolt. Now, what does the smolt do? They live in the estuaries between where the salt water and and fresh water mix. Mm -hmm. They need dissolved oxygen, oxygen and food like insects. Mm -hmm. And um, what type of water is the is the, uh, found in the estuary? Salty and uh, fresh. Fresh water mix. Okay, fresh. Yeah. Got any more pictures there? Yeah. yeah. The adult. Oh, uh huh. How long do these fish live in the ocean? You learn. A couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can vary. They can live anywhere from two to five years. And uh, then what happens? They spawn. come up to where they were hatched and they spawn. Yeah, they come right back up to these streams and uh, this is the area where they spawn. Now, by maybe some of the folks don't know what spawning is, but that's basically the females digging in the gravel and uh, laying the eggs, the male fertilizes them, and then they cover up the eggs so uh, the predators won't uh, eat the eggs. And what happens after that? They die. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yeah, salmon, uh, after they uh, are born, go out to the ocean and return, uh, that's it, they die. <laughs> and uh, their salmon carcasses, uh, provide fertilizer for the rest of the aquatic ecosystem and the wetland ecosystem. So that's it, I guess. Wow, salmon are amazing. Thank you, students and Ken. I can see why both freshwater wetlands and estuaries are necessary for salmon to survive. We've been looking at habitat and talking about the salmon life cycle. I hear that you've been raising salmon fry in school. Let's go take a look at the tank and see how you created salmon habitat. Here we are at Mount Eccles Elementary School to take a look at the tank where the salmon have been growing for the past few months. Out in the stream we saw what makes a good habitat for growing salmon and here the students will tell us how they try to maintain a healthy habitat for those salmon they raised. We're here with Kate Morse who is going to explain a little bit more about the project. Kate is program director for the Copper River Watershed Project. Tell us about this project. So I'm one partner that works with some other community partners and the students at Mount Eccles to maintain the salmon tank here in the elementary school. Uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game manages this program across the state to help students learn more about the early life stages of salmon that are hard to see in the wild. So I have two students here that are going to help with our routine tank maintenance. So we're going to start with Aaron, who's going to explain one of the daily routines that we do here in Cordova for the salmon tank. Um, we're going to measure, or we're going to measure the temperature, and we want cold water. We don't want warm water. Anything 
over 12 is bad. Great. And what kind of water is in the tank? Go ahead, you can keep um, measuring. Fresh water. And I think it was all right, so Anika is recording that. And then we also add that temperature to all the accumulated thermal units that we have calculated since the salmon went into this tank. Erin, why don't you switch and come over here? I'd like to give the dissolved oxygen. So why do we want to measure dissolved oxygen? Why is that important for our fish? To see if they uh, have enough oxygen in the water because they freeze in the water so it's coming up for air. Why don't you make this one your sample? All right, so while she's doing that test, do you see that container? Do you want to go do the same thing with that one that she just did? So you can go around to the side. So why don't you show everyone how you get that filled with our sample of water? You take this thing and you break the tip. And break the tip off, and using capillary action, it fills up with our water sample. So why are you moving it up and down like that? What does that do? It moves the bubble up and down to mix everything up. Great. So we have to let that one rest a minute, right? Squeeze out the rest and carefully step on down. OK, I'm just going to step in front of you here. So with our ammonia test, do we want a lot of ammonia or a little ammonia? A little. Little to no. So this is a measure of um, ammonia comes from the fish as they excrete their waste. And so we want to make sure that their water is healthy for the fish. All right, so two drops of this. And I'm going to give you one of these. And first you're going to use it like a mixing spoon to mix those two drops into it. So before you break it, there you go. And then you can go ahead and do that same thing, break that tip off. So it fills up with water a little bit harder. There you go. Perfect. So now you go ahead and you can just set that back down on the counter. Do you want to grab those comparison tubes there, Anika, so we can get our dissolved oxygen? Whew. All right, so what do you say? Are we at the top? I think it's very much both. I think we have a lot of oxygen in our tank. That's a good thing. So do you want to record that for me on our data sheet? So let's go ahead and looks like it's less than that. And then because ammonia, they want to measure traces of it. Those are our whole numbers. And let's go ahead and drop this in here. And this allows us to compare it to the decimal points. So which one does it look like on the bottom there? Go ahead and point to it, and then we'll see what the number is on the side. It looks like that one. You agree? Is this one or that one? Yeah. Sure. All right, what does it say on the side? Zero or 0 0.1. All right, so very low levels. So we can go ahead, let's see. I think we're safe to call it zero. All right, well, that we've got healthy water. We've got happy fish. What's the last thing that they need in their habitat? You think they're hungry? Ooh, yeah. All right, let's feed them. <laughs> Perfect, yep. All right, do we have everything recorded? And everything looks like it's running. We've got oxygen. We've got our water being cooled. I think we're done here. So thanks, everyone. All those things help make sure the salmon would be ready to release into their native habitat. Let's go back out to Fleming Spit, where we're going to release a few of the salmon fry into the wild. All right, so here we are at Fleming Spit. We're going to release some of our coho salmon for the rest of their life cycle. We're here at the edge of the stream. Uh, Anika, what kind of water do we have in this stream here? Fresh. Fresh water, all right. Um, Aaron, do you remember what's on the other side of the road over there? What kind of water we have? Um, salt water. Salt water, yeah. So these salmon are gonna be migrating from the fresh water out into the salt water for the rest of their adult life cycle. Does anyone remember what we call where these two types of water mix? Estuary. Estuary, excellent. So as these fry grow up in the estuary and get used to that uh, salt water, what life stage do we call that? Smolt. Smolt, excellent. 
All right, so um, we will release these coho to turn into smolt and get ready for their adult life out in the ocean. So let's go ahead and start with you. Make sure you know how many fish are in your cups so we can tell fish and game how many we've released. Swim free, Willie. All right, go ahead. Safe journeys, fishies. She will come out. You can tilt it down a little bit if you need to. <laughs> Only one. Guys, They're get confused. out. They're going the wrong way. Oh, uh, actually, the fry might live in, for coho. They might stay in freshwater for a few years before they go out to the ocean. Huh. All right, Erin, you go ahead and release yours. Uh, you can fishies. see how they camouflage in the gravel, huh? Their color matches those rocks perfectly. Excellent, all right. There you go, have freedom. All right, well, what do you say we come back in a few years and see if we can catch them on a rod and reel as they return as adults? Wanna go fishing? Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Great job, everyone. So these salmon we just released will use this wetland habitat here while they get ready to head out to the ocean and then return to complete their life cycle. Not only kids in Alaska, but kids from across the country have been inspired to get out and explore their local wetlands. Ms. Amaral's class from Fred Lynn Middle School in Woodbridge, Virginia has been getting out and learning about wetlands in the Occoquan National Wildlife Refuge on the Potomac River. Let's take a look at what they've been doing. Hi, I'm Amy Amaral. I'm a sixth grade science teacher at Fredland Middle School. Today we have our kids out here at the Aquaquan Wildlife Reserve. They're here to participate in their meaningful watershed experience that relates to our SOLs. The students have an opportunity to see the different creatures that live close around them because they all live here uh, in the Aquaquan watershed. Um, and we get a chance to actually have a hands-on experience to see what the wa how healthy the water is. So we were testing how acidic the water was. What we did is we got test tubes and we took um, little tablets and we dropped them in and we shook them up with the water that, that we got from samples. And we saw what color the water was and we took it and we compared it and we got seven. If it's too acidic or if it's too neutral, then the um, fish can't live in it. It's fantastic that they can come to this area where it's undisturbed because the results that they get really show that protected areas lead to water quality that's um, very high. Now this is in stark contrast. They can then compare the results they get here to the results that they find back at their schoolyards. We can learn a lot about water quality with just a few simple tests. Thank you, Fred Lynn students, for your report about water testing and macroinvertebrates. Now we'll check back in with our last group here in Cordova who have been working on restoring a local wetland using native plants. We're here at Odiac Pond, which is a student-managed wetland in Cordova. Let's get back to Kate, who has also been working with students of many different grades on monitoring and restoring this wetland habitat. So what can you tell me about what you've been doing here, Kate? Well, I've been working with students since 2009 to study this pond ecosystem. We caught coho salmon and proved that they were living here and we were able to turn that data into the state of Alaska. They maintain a catalog called the Anadromous Waters Catalog where all streams, ponds that are important for salmon rearing, migration, and spawning um, are listed so that we can provide better protections for those important waterways. And so this in the heart of our community is a great opportunity to restore a habitat that supports a species that's very important to our local economy. Got commercial fishing families represented right here, right Dane? All right, so we've been doing a lot of restoration work and today we're going to be working in our native plant garden that we're establishing here. We'll be raising native plants for educational purposes as well as to generate seeds for revegetation projects in areas where we remove invasive plants. We will stop by our plots where we're experimenting with different methods for removing invasive plants. And finally, we'll demonstrate how we transplant vegetation to help improve the, the wetland habitat. So it's th this project with the native plants where we're gonna start began in March when we planted seeds in the classroom. And I have some students here who are gonna talk about some of the native plants we're growing for our garden. Fantastic. Oh. So Elena, what was one of the seeds that you remember planting? Uh, 
blue joint reed grass because um, it helps control erosion, uh, has shelter and protection for animals, and then it gives them food. Yeah, and you remember why I was really excited about blue joint reed grass for our yeah. revegetation projects? Because it gives off a lot of seed. Exactly, great. And Jimmy, what's another plant that we're growing? Sedges because they um, control um, erosion. They like wet places. They shelter and protection for small fish. They clean up water and soil, and they're food for animals. Great, yep, so sedges are going to be also very important. And Dane, what's another plant that we're growing for our garden? Wormwood, because it helps cure medicinal problems. It's food for people and animals, and yeah. Great. Well, it looks like we have some of our teammates that are already busy building the rock walls, so let's go and join them and get our garden ready for planting. Okay. So this bed here is what we're gonna try to make into our mini wetlands. So. Uh, Jimmy, do you think that maybe your plants would like this, the yeah. sedges, because they like that wet environment? And so the three plants that you discussed are going to be planted in here to be able to be transplanted? Or they're just going to They're going to be here? transplanted here, um, and then the seeds will be harvested, and we'll dry the seeds out in the fall. We'll car collect them in the fall, dry them out over the winter, and then uh, when we remove tarps where we're trying to get rid of uh, an invasive plant, then there's an exposed area with no plants, and so we'd like to use these seeds to revegetate because they're native plants. They're already accustomed to growing in this climate, and uh, like Elena said, the blue joint reed grass produces a lot of seeds, so it's an effective tool for spreading um, to in these barren areas to get native plants to regrow. All right, well, maybe let's start with the invasive plants before we get dirty. Does anyone want to share what you think invasive plants are? Because they can take over areas and they won't let um, native plants grow because they take over too much. Yeah, so one of the plants that we're doing restoration work on is reed canary grass, trying to remove it. And that's a plant that can reproduce by its rhizomes. So it doesn't even need seeds. It just grows from its plant and can form very, very dense mats. And it makes it hard for other native vegetation to grow. And because it's so dense, Micah, do you think it's any good for wildlife if it's a really dense mat? No. no, they can't live in it, that's right. And it's not very edible, so local wildlife doesn't like to eat it. Because it's a little early, we're not going to plant everything yet. Here in Alaska, spring comes late. Um, but we'll go ahead and demonstrate what we'll do once we're ready to plant this whole garden. Um, this bed that we constructed, we're going to make into a mini wetland so that people that visit this park are going to be able to learn about wetland plants. Um, so, Jimmy, earlier you talked about what type of plant? Sedges. All right. What do you have in that bucket? Sedges. Sedges. Great. So, um, sedges need what kind of environment to grow in? Wet places. Wet places. So, we're going to pretend this is our garden bed here. And um, we're going to start. Dane, can I have your help down here? What's in this bucket there? This one? Yeah. What is that? Sand. Sand. So we're going to start filling in, fill this bucket about that deep with sand. So why do you think we put sand to help make it a wetland? Do you think about if we were to pour a cup of water through these rocks that we're sitting on or through the sand? It would make mud. This will make mud. The water won't flow through as quickly, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And then, um, Elena, can you tell me, do, do plants get a lot of nutrients out of sand? No. No. So what else should we add to our bucket? Soil. Soil, yeah. Do you want to add some of that soil into this bucket? Excellent. And so what does that soil have in it that helps make plants grow? Does anyone remember? Fertilizer. Well, this might have some extra fertilizer, but what is the N-word that the plants need to make their food? Nutrients. Nutrients. Excellent. So, so Jimmy, come on down with your sedges. Great, yeah, we'll get a hole going in there. So what do you have, what's this part here? Roots. roots. And so why are these roots important? Why are they important for the plant? That's all right, that's extra. Why are um, these roots important for the plant? They suck up water. Mm-hmm. And why are they important to us? Um, why do we like these roots? What do they help when we plant them along the edges oh, of streams? So they don't, so they don't, um, they help erosion and they don't um, go away. This um, makes them stick into the ground. Yep, and exactly what you said, it helps keep the dirt in place too so it doesn't erode away. 
All right, let's make sure we get those roots down in the bottom there. Elena and I have parted. See if you can get that plant, get those roots down as far as you can. Excellent. Okay, and so now we'll fill in around. And you can see that that one actually has two shoots growing off of the same plant. So it's kind of how reed canary grass grows super effective. Excellent. Well, the last thing we'll need is to add some water, but we'll have to get that later. <laughs> so now that we know a little bit more about why native plants are important, let's go see what else is being done to restore Odiac Pond. This is the third part of your restoration project at Odiac. Why don't you tell me about what you're doing? Well, reed canary grass is a very invasive plant and it lives here and we're trying to get rid of it. Kevin, can you tell why it's bad? Well, the reed canary grass goes in streams and ponds and it makes it impossible for the fish to pass. And it will be very bad for the salmon. Do you have something else, James, you could tell about reed canary grass? Um, the reed canary grass outcompetes other native plants and it's good for the fish and wildlife. So we want to have native plants that are good for the fish and wildlife. So the Watershed Project has been experimenting with different treatments for how to remove reed canary grass that's growing in water. So what we're here to do today is to fix some tarps that were placed last year that were trying to um, eradicate reed canary grass. Anika, can you explain why the tarps are effective for eradicating reed canary grass? Well, they cover up to the sunlight so they can't grow and then it, then it covers them up so they can't go over and it blocks out the sunlight. Do you remember how long we want to have these tarps in place? Three years. Great. So why don't you go grab some steaks for me and James, do you want to go get that mallet and we'll get ready to secure this tarp that's been out over the winter. So I'm going to go ahead and cut a slit in this tarp. And then, Anika, I want to have you come stand with your back to this side. We're going to get it going here. And do you want to, can you hold down here? Uh, let's see how we're going to do this. I want you to hold so we don't want to get your fingers pounded here. So I'll put these up here. All right, and... Yeah, so go ahead and stand because James is going to come with the hammer, just like a nail. And so we want it to go in at an angle. Can you? Perfect. There we go. Keep going in. Okay, let's see here. Uh, why don't you give it one more whack for good luck? Woo! There we go. <laughs> Great. So that's the middle of our tarp. So I think we've got the edge of it right here. It says, We'll set one more right here. So James, come stand over here on my side. And let me cut our slit in first. Aha, see, this is supposed to be anchored and it came out. Anika, why do you think our tarp has a hard place, hard time staying in place in Cordova? Um, there is lots of water and the water can make it uh, erode, the ground erode, so the things can come out. Stick. Ooh, okay. Yeah, we got a lot of strong weather too. Okay, so Kevin, do you want to hold that down low? And James, you want to pound that one in gently. Be careful with Kevin's fingers. All right, so I think this one looks secure. What do you say we go find some litter that's in this pond? I saw some on our way here and we can uh, clean up this wetland on our way out. Sounds good. All right, so I see some over there. Anika, can you go get that bag there? Kevin, do you see any others? I'll come over and help pull you out if you get stuck. <laughs> can you reach it? Yeah, we need to re-anchor some of our songbird habitat here, huh? There we go, we've got a piece right here. Get it? Great. <laughs> Perfect, good work. 
So thanks students and Kate. It's amazing how native plants help create the healthy habitat that species like salmon and shorebirds need. The work the students are doing is really going to improve habitat for the species that live here. Let's meet another group of students from Virginia who have been working with their community in Fairfax to create a special kind of wetlands called a vernal pool. I'm Christopher Roskind and I'm with Linear Mill School Eco Club and today we're building a vernal pool. A vernal pool is a type of wetland that is seasonal. It holds water and you see water on the surface in the form of a small pond, but it only lasts for part of the year. In German actually they call it a Himmelsteich, uh, a pond from heaven, and the reason that they call it that is because it's, it's not fed by streams usually or any other water sources, but uh, by the rain that, that falls down from the sky. We call them a vernal pool because vernal means spring and it's in the springtime when these aquatic environments, these wetlands, are sort of the most full of water and teeming with all kinds of living organisms. Invertebrates, aquatic insects, amphibians, that's when they're sort of at their peak of activity. Every season there's something different. They are dry meadowlands in the summer. They're these full aquatic realms in the winter. In spring they festoon with wildflowers. So because they're different in every season, there is this whole ebb and flow of different animals and plants that's different in every season. This little tiny temporary pond in the forest, though it may only be the size of your living room, services a whole forest community on the order of about one square mile. And so every common type of wildlife you could think of, deer and songbirds and raccoons, would be able to utilize that. A lot of animals in migration, like ducks, can use these as a stopover to rest and feed. And then there is amphibians. And without that little pond in this larger forest, that whole community of thousands of amphibians wouldn't be able to reproduce. So it's crucial for that whole community of amphibians to exist. Why are they important? Turns out salamanders are more essential to the stability of a whole forest than deer or songbirds are. And it's because they're situated in the middle of the food web. Amphibians are right here in the middle. All the critters that eat them are up here, but all the critters that they eat are down here. And the transfer of energy, say from insects through amphibians that eat them to larger predators like owls and hawks that eat the salamanders is critical upon this group of critters. If all of those mid-level predators and prey, the salamanders were removed, that whole forest ecosystem would collapse. Vernal pools are, are special areas that often get built over. They're not recognized as anything important, so they could easily get taken over by houses or roads. It just looks like a puddle. So that's why we need to be really bringing them back. We've lost over 90% and probably a lot closer to 99% of vernal pool habitat in this area. We're gonna be digging out the first foot of soil. Then there's people carting the dirt away in wheelbarrows, and they have people raking leaves away so that we can extend the vernal pool a little bit. I'm raking up leaves so we could put it back in a specific place to help the pool's environment. And then we're going to pack down the soil. After that, the uh, water should be able to sit on top of the soil. Showing them that this is a watershed right here, you have a wetland right here next to the school and the school was built on a wetland, they can make the connection. The vernal pool, it should last for as long as Cutner Park does, which hopefully a couple more centuries. The high school biology teacher started a program 
and with his high school students, they learned to identify vernal pools, they learned to collect that data in a systematic fashion, and an inventory, formally, each and every vernal pool they could find in their neighborhood of Reading, Massachusetts. They submitted the information, and then the state protected over 10,000 vernal pools. And most other states, whether it's in New England, or down here in the South, or out in California, that have turned their attention to these types of wetlands, they have followed the model of what was started by high school students in Massachusetts. But that's the magic. Now for the results that many of you have been waiting for. The winner of our National Wetlands Live video contest. This contest was open to any school participating in Wetlands Live and getting out into the wetlands. The winning class will receive $1,000 to use toward field trip supplies and other related activities. Our winning video first made it through a panel of wetlands experts who selected the top three videos and then was voted on by the Wetlands Live community on our Facebook page back in April. Our national video contest winner is da -da -da, Ms. Jennifer Ching's class from San Pedro, California. Let's take a look at their video and see what they've been doing in wetlands. At the intersection of 22nd Street and Crescent Avenue in San Pedro, California, lies the sprawling 22nd Street Park, 18 acres of grass and trees laced with biking and walking trails and boasting great vistas of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Tucked into a corner of this park is a tiny freshwater wetland first discovered in 2002 by community activist Kathy Beauregard, who currently serves as an officer in the adopt a storm Dream Foundation. Today, the 9th grade honors biology class of Mrs. Jennifer Chang from San Pedro High School is here at the 22nd Street Wetland to conduct water quality tests. Her students will be testing the water in the wetland for several parameters including pH, dissolved oxygen, mineral content, and hardness. Before the class could start their experiment, the water samples from the wetland had to be collected, so a few of the students ventured in and took care of that. testing for everything on this little chart and there's about nine things you got you got to take these tablets and you put them into each little container but you have to make sure which one you're testing to like go up and down for four minutes go okay. four minutes it has like an yeah it will change colors during the experiment we decided to come in and interview some of the class on what they had discovered so far we have collected the ph level which is seven and first we tested the dissolved oxygen, which was 4 ppm. The phosphates are 4 ppm also. And the copper was 1.5 ppm. And right now we're testing the hardness. And we have to keep dissolving tablets until it turns blue. And once it turns blue, we have to multiply the number of tablets by 40 to get the hardness level. And we're on then. So what would the hardness indicate? The hardness indicates that how the how how healthy and fresh oh, yeah. the water is. So does this water fire, does this water qualify as a uh, fresh water? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, we're does. already on nine, and that's a and lot. And there's no iron or chlorine, and the pH all. is seven, so that's, that's good. So I mean, just more basic. Than this. Yeah. yeah. Or it's like the middle. It's like yeah, the middle. It's neutral. Oh, it's neutral. Okay, so what would the experiments uh, show that you guys performed in the wet lab? We first got the water which was like actually really filthy. You could see like little creatures moving in it, but that doesn't mean it's not fresh. So what we did was like get the water and it came with these tiny pills that we put in. And what was kind of a hassle was looking for the hardness. We had to keep on mixing it until it turned blue. So we put like at least like nine pills in there and then it eventually turned blue. And um, from the results from last year, how would they differ to this year? Oh, actually no change at all, which is really good. So, the water's doing good. So you heard it, the water is good. Water testing is crucial in determining the impact the surrounding environment and activities are having on the well-being of a wetland. 
These young scientists are learning the importance of documenting the results of water quality parameter tests and comparing them to data from previous years. Keeping a record of our little wetlands health will help preserve this habitat and the rich biodiversity it supports. It's been so interesting to spend this year exploring wetlands with you. If you'd like to know more about wetlands, go to the Wetlands Live website where we've got lots of information for you to use to explore the wetlands in your area. Remember, wetlands are an incredible, rich ecosystem. They're very important for people and wildlife. And I hope you get out there to learn more or to volunteer to help conserve these special places. This is our last Wetlands Live program but the Forest Service and Prince William Network will be bringing more live virtual field trips to you from around the world. To learn about upcoming programs and other news about getting outdoors in our public lands, check out the FS Nature Live website and Facebook page. Thanks class, students, and special guests for being with us today. And I wanna thank all of you who watched today. I especially wanna thank our sponsors and partners, including the USDA Forest Service, the Pacific Coast Joint Venture, the Cordova School District, and Alaska Geographic. Remember, you only care about what you know about. Thank you all for joining us today. Bye. Bye.